Well, as, as I go down the road of life, I am uh, continually reminded that uh, there is really no separation from the spiritual and the sacred, that, that everything, uh, or from the secular and the sacred, that indeed everything is spiritual, and you can find theology just about everywhere. You may remember that last week I spoke about uh, Bob Dylan and uh, the very surprising uh, news revealed in a Rolling Stone article. You may remember that I said that his song, Rainy Day Woman, along with the line, Everybody Must Get Stoned, uh, ap- actually has nothing to do with drugs, but Bob says rather that it has everything to do with the stoning of Stephen in the book of Acts. Well, this week I'd like to move, uh, as we continue in the book of Acts, I'd like to move from uh, Bob Dylan to another great singer known as Willie Nelson, and um, his words often touch on so many facets of life, and many of you are familiar with the excerpts of this song, and here's some excerpts from his song, On the Road Again, just can't wait to get on the road again, going places that I've never seen, saying things that I may never see again, I can't get to wait, can't wait to get on the road again. Now, although this song specifically refers to life on the road as a band, the song points to something else that many of us know very well. And that is that much like a road trip, life is indeed a journey. A journey in which we sometimes go to places we've never been, one in which we may see things we may never see again. And such experiences can be joyful and wonderful At other times, however, they are experiences we would rather not have or ever have to think about again. And to put it more simply, each of us is on the road of life, and we've all had great, stunning, and superb moments in our life. However, most, if not all of us, had had others that were bad or even horrible. We've all gone through passages, or maybe even decades, that were stellar, or frankly, others we'd rather forget. That's just the way that it is, and certainly was the way that it was for a fellow named Paul, the Paul that we know so well through stories and letters in the New Testament. What an amazing life Paul had. It was an extraordinary life. Was it easy? No. Was it hard as hell? Absolutely. But it's a life that made a tremendous difference and changed, in fact, the course of the world. You see, it's through Paul's life lets us know that change and the unexpected happens. That total transformation is never beyond the range of possibility. That new ways of thinking about life and its challenges can occur. That bad can turn into good, despair into hope, tragedy into meaning, regret into a sense of peace, and a misguided life into one of purpose. Paul's life tells us all of that. If you ever lose hope, if you ever believe that something cannot change, immerse yourself into getting to know the life of Paul. Now, as I mentioned last week, Paul was not only present, but endorsed the literal stoning of Stephen. And Stephen was not the only one. Paul, in fact, had a long history of going after children, women, and men in cruel ways for not being in step with the very narrow religious thinking of his day. Paul, in fact, was at one point in his life a very vicious man. As he felt called by God to persecute and go after those who did not believe the way that he did. But then it happened. Paul met Jesus, or shall I say, the resurrected Jesus sought out Paul. And everything for Paul literally flipped and changed 180 degrees. Now that alone must have been really tough. Can you imagine having your entire worldview shattered and turned completely upside down and around? Now when Jesus changed Paul, Paul spent the rest of his life spreading the story of Jesus. We know that Paul planted churches all over the countries that surround the Mediterranean. He served other people. He mentored people on how to lead. And he reminded people about what the ultimate purpose of life is, which is love. Now, Willie Nelson travels by bus. 
Paul, however, walked on rocky trails and took wooden ships on the water and endured incredible hardship any time he hit the road again. And not everyone that Paul encountered was a friend. Here, in fact, is how Paul describes much of his life in a letter that he wrote to the people of Corinth. Listen to his words. I've worked much harder, been jailed more often, beaten up more times than I can count, and at death's door time after time after time. I've been flogged five times, beaten by rods three times, pummeled with rocks. I've been shipwrecked three times, immersed in the open sea for night and day. In hard traveling year in and year out, I've had to ford rivers, fend off robbers, struggle with friends, struggle with foes. I've been at risk in the city, at risk in the country, endangered by sun and storm, and betrayed by people I thought were my brothers. I've known drudgery and hard labor and many a long night. And that's not the half of it when you throw in the daily pressures and anxieties of all the churches. Think of what he just said. Yet, if you study and read the life of Paul, he is a person of profound, immense hope. Paul was continually on the road again, as I mentioned. He took multiple trips and covered thousands of miles and while flying coach right now on a long trip is very uncomfortable, it is the epitome of luxury <laughs> compared to what and how Paul traveled 2,000 years ago. Can you imagine? Well, for a moment, I want to look at our reading today from the book of Acts, and I want to get into it a little bit and then pull out what we can take from it, but let's just look at the reading from today. Paul is in the midst of his second missionary journey. And where he went on that journey is actually pictured on the front of the bulletin. And can you imagine going by ship and walking all that way? Paul traveled from Israel to Lebanon, from what is current day Israel to Lebanon to Syria, all the way across Turkey to Greece and back to Israel. And it was on this trip that Paul and a companion of his name, Silas, were in a town called Philippi. And when they got to Philippi, they were beaten up and thrown in jail. And Paul had ticked everybody off because he was teaching people about Jesus. And he ticked people off because he challenged a fortune teller who was making big bucks on the local population. They threw him in jail for it. And through a miraculous event, Paul and Silas get out of jail. They travel on to Thessalonica and Berea. They have more trouble there. And then Paul runs off to Athens. That's where we encounter him in our reading today. Now, when Paul gets to Athens, he knew about the city, and he wanted to check it out. And he opens his eyes to learn as much as he can about the people of Athens. He meets people. He talks to people. And as Paul explored the city of Athens, a lot of what he saw didn't make him very happy. Lots of people in Athens bought little objects that they worshipped, and they venerated as their gods. And a variety of gods were venerated. And the city was full of philosophers. Stoics and Epicureans. The Stoics were the philosophers that believed that you need to live life with self-sufficiency and what you really need to do in life is suppress all of your emotion and suppress all of human desire. And on top of that, he ran into the Epicureans who thought very differently. They believed that the purpose of life is to live with total and utmost pleasure, that that's the ultimate goal. Well, it's into this philosophical and choose-your-own-God mix that we find Paul in Athens. And as he was in a city with people who asked deep questions, one day Paul was asked to speak at the Areopagus, which is in the middle of Athens, right near the Acropolis. Now the Areopagus was a location, it was a dirt hill, it's in your bulletin, you can see a picture, it's a dirt hill, where people met, and it was called the Areopagus, and they met on the Areopagus, <laughs> So it's both a name of a group and a place. And they met to talk about civil affairs and religious issues and moral issues. And it was a place where people would talk about all kinds of grand ideas. Think of it as kind of the Aspen Ideas Festival in Greece. So Paul is asked to talk. And so he does. And what he does is, in a very brilliant way, Paul says, he opens up, and all the people are gathered on this hill, and Paul says, you all are so religious. 
they would have all nodded, yes, we're very religious. We have lots of gods. <laughs> and then he said, I even saw an altar in the city. And below the altar it said, dedicated to an unknown god. They would have all nodded, yes. And Paul pulled them in. And then he said, you know what? The god that you think is unknown is actually very well known. And you get to know that God through the person of Jesus. Then, in fact, if you know Jesus, you know this God that you think is so unknown. And on top of that, my God, my Jesus, was resurrected. What? They said. Many found Paul's teachings kind of interesting from a philosophical standpoint, but a lot of people sneered and rejected what Paul had to say. There was a mixture of reactions. Some rejected him, some sneered at him, some became interested in hearing more, and some actually came into relationship with Christ. Well, that's what happened. So now what I'd like to do just for a few moments is I'd like to go back to that dusty hill and think about what it is that we can learn from the Areopagus in Paul's talk. I want to get into tips for the road that we're on as people of faith, so to speak. Things that we can keep in mind in mind is on our own journey in faith. Tips to keep in mind. And I just want to touch on a few things that we can pull from Paul's talk on that hill. Well, the first thing that is important for all of us as people of faith to take away is that when people ask Paul to talk, he was totally prepared to do so. People said, tell us about your faith. He was ready. And Paul not only knew what to say, but he knew how to say it. And if you look closely at Paul's words, as I, as I suggested, he met people at first where they are. He didn't say, you know, you all are full of it. You're wrong. You're, you're going to go to hell. You're, you're, you clearly don't know what you believe. You, you, you've thought in misguided ways forever. Instead, he started from a position of common ground. You all are very religious. Yes. And they would have agreed, and they would have not been defensive to hear what Paul said next. So this little tidbit leads to two kind of short conclusions about what it means for us to be prepared. Now, you may, may remember, I don't remember if it was a year ago or two years ago, that I asked you to think about and come up with an elevator speech. An elevator speech is something that you say that is so clear and so brief and so compelling that you could say it to another person in the short time it takes to ride up an elevator. Now, if someone were to ask you, like they asked Paul, tell us about your faith, could you do so? Would you do so? Are you prepared to do so? Do you have an elevator speech in mind if and when the opportunity arises for you to share your faith? Just like, as I said, when people ask Paul to share his faith. And related to this, and of equal importance, is could you share your faith in such a way that people would not be defensive in hearing what you share? Now, as followers of Christ, I believe that we are called to be ready to speak when another person asks and approaches us to describe and share our faith. And we need to do so in a way that creates openness. Well, another lesson or tip for the journey in faith from the Areopagus has to do with opposition. Paul experienced opposition in his life, didn't he? <laughs> and sometimes that opposition, in fact, got extreme. But the opposition didn't throw him, didn't cause him to give up his faith, didn't cause him to hide his faith, and he certainly was not embarrassed about his faith. Now, like Paul, if we make the decision to follow Christ, not everybody's going to like it. Not everybody is going to appreciate the fact that you are a Christian. You will experience opposition. I've had people over my 19 years in ministry scoff at me. I've had people talk behind my back. I've had people in every church I've served make fun of me because I talk about Jesus. I've had people view me as simple-minded and not having much between my ears. All because of my decision to follow Christ. And when I felt sorry for myself, I thought of Paul. Opposition is part of the game. 
And the story of the Areopagus is a great example of what it can feel and look like. And just as opposition didn't throw Paul, neither should opposition throw us. It's part of the deal. It's just the way that it is. Let me say it very simply. There is no way that everybody you know is going to think the fact that you are a Christian is a good thing at all. Well, aside from being prepared and experiencing opposition, another lesson or tip from the Areopagus and Paul's life in general is that being a Christ follower does not necessarily mean the facts will always change. But certainly how we view, deal with, and respond to what is happening will. Remember all that Paul went through his life? It was not easy. Brutal. His faith didn't always change the facts of what he endured. But it dramatically, dramatically changed and affected the way that he dealt with what came his way. In his letter to the people of Rome, Paul writes, we can take pride in our problems because we know that trouble produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And then later in the same letter, he writes, rejoice in hope, endure in suffering, persist in prayer. And then when Paul was in prison in Rome, he wrote to the people of Philippi, one of the most important verses of Scripture. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Paul's point, sometimes things are sometimes terrible. And when that is the way that it is, God calls us not to focus on what is terrible, but rather the presence of God that is within us, who is giving us strength, who is giving us the power to endure, who is giving us the power to overcome, who is giving us what it is that we need to face what it is we're facing. And when we do that, how we see things will change. Related to this, Paul didn't like losing people that died. I don't either. I think death stinks. In fact, the theological term is it sucks. <laughs> but here's what Paul writes about death in his letter to the people of Thessalonica. And now, dear brothers and sisters, want you to know that what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Paul's point, we're human. Grieve. We suffer terribly when someone we love dies. But let us, Paul writes, grieve knowing there is hope for the future because of the resurrection of Christ. We need not worry about those who have gone in the midst of our grief and tears. They are in the hands of God. Faith doesn't change the fact of death, but it changes the way we see and cope with the fact of death. Now having said all this, just a quick caveat, clearly, with faith, miracles do happen. Clearly with faith, prayer does change things. But the point is that sometimes despite our prayers, the facts remain the same. And Paul's point is that with faith, it will change the way we respond to those facts. And aside from being prepared and experiencing opposition to our faith and that faith can change how we respond to life's happenings, the final takeaway or tip for the road I'd like to mention from our reading is this. Paul said, in him, we live and move and have our being. Memorize that. In God, I live and move and have my being. In God, I live and move and have my being. A different version of the Bible, which I like, says it this way. God doesn't play hide and seek with us. God's not remote. God is near. We live and move in him. We can't get away from him. Now, this thought was not totally novel to Paul. In fact, long before Paul was alive, King David of Israel understood the very same point. Listen to what David wrote in the 139th Psalm. That's the very same point. David writes, I'm an open book to you, God. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. 
You know when I leave, you know when I get back, I'm never out of your sight. You know everything that I'm gonna say before I say it. I look behind me, you're there. I look ahead, you're there. Is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit, to be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I fly on morning's wings to the far western horizon, you'll find me, you're there already waiting. David's point is the same as Paul's point. In God, we move and live and have our being. Say that to yourself, in God, I move and have my being. It's powerful. Now, whether we believe, whether we are in trouble, whether we are in pain or misery or a state of suffering, whether we're joyful or happy, whether things are going well or quite the opposite, whether we trust God, whether we turn to God, whether we see God, whether we don't see God, God is everywhere and within every nook and cranny of our bodies. Powerful point Paul was making that day on the Areopagus. Think of it this way. You know, whether or not you are aware of it, throughout the service this morning, your body has been filled with something. It's been filled with oxygen. Even if you aren't aware of it. Now, you can deny that your body is filled with oxygen, but it would still be there. You could even say, I want nothing to do with oxygen, but it'll still be there. You could try and run away from oxygen. It's still part of you. And the presence, the full presence of God is kind of like that. God is within you no matter what. For it is within God that we move and live and have our being. So my friends, life is indeed a road trip. God wants you to immerse yourself continually in the handbook for that road trip. Scripture. It's full of tips for the road, including Paul's talk on that hill, the Areopagus, so long ago. So just to summarize, be prepared. Be prepared to talk about your faith and to share it with others in a way that doesn't create defensiveness. Remember, not everybody's going to like the fact you're a Christian. There will be opposition, and the more seriously you follow Christ, the more serious the opposition will become. Faith on the surface does not always change the realities we are confronted with, but will dramatically affect how we cope, respond to, and deal with what comes our way. And finally, wherever you are on the road of life, regardless of what kind of road you are on, whomever you are on the road with, you are living, you are moving, and you are having your being infused with the full presence of God. Take courage from that. Take inspiration from that. Take heart from Paul's words as you venture out on the road again.